a scientist, there are really two main areas where I focus most of my energy and attention. The first is spending time in the lab coming up with ideas and doing experiments to test them. A second, perhaps equally important task, is to take what we've learned in the lab and try to communicate it to many different audiences, including other scientists or funding agencies or even the general public. And this isn't always very easy to do, as you might imagine. Area of bio-nanotechnology. So your first question might be, what is bio-nanotechnology? We can start by breaking it down. Everybody knows that bio stands for biology, which is the study of plants and insects and animals and basically all of life on this planet. Next up is nano, which is short for nanometer, which is equal to one billionth of a meter. Now, I'm always totally amazed by the diversity of life at the macro scale, but something that I think makes life even more amazing and more elegant in a way is that when you zoom into the nanometer scale, it turns out that we're all made of the exact same tiny bits of stuff. Things like DNA and proteins and sugars and fats. Basically, nature has taken just a handful of really versatile building blocks and just figured out how to arrange them in so many different ways to solve pretty much every problem that you can imagine. Now, you can talk about one billionth of a meter, and of course that sounds like a really small distance but it's not necessarily easy to understand how small that really is. So I like to use a US penny as a visual aid to connect the concept of a nanometer to something tangible that you can actually hold in your hands. If you look at the back of a shiny new penny, it probably has some kind of Captain America shield on it. But if you look at a slightly older penny, it shows the Lincoln Memorial. And right in the middle of the memorial, there's a tiny Abraham Lincoln. And if you can imagine tiny Abraham Lincoln's eyelash, it would have about a diameter of 100 nanometers. So next time you come across a penny, take a look at the back, and maybe you could try to imagine that small scale. So now we know bio, we know nano. What about technology? I like to think of technology as what we get when we take all of our knowledge from science and engineering and harness it for some purpose. So in the field of bio-nanotechnology, we're taking the building blocks of life, and specifically the nanoscale building blocks, and trying to invent new ways of putting them together for useful applications. For example, one application of bio-nanotechnology might be to build tools to help us understand how life works at the molecular level. If you wanted to understand how some device works at the macro scale, like an alarm clock, the first thing you might do is get some tools to take it apart and look inside to see what's going on. This isn't really a problem for large objects because it's easy to make the properly scaled tools. But if you imagine shrinking that alarm clock down to the nanoscale and then trying to study it, that's going to be much more of a challenge because most of our tools are much bigger than the things that we typically study at that scale. If we want to understand how nanoscale assemblies work, I think it makes sense to build tools that are roughly the same size. That way it'll be easier to take apart these systems and understand why they work and the reasons why they might break. And looking forward, we might even be able to use these tools or similar ones to fix problems or maybe even make improvements to existing systems. The hope is that we can use bio nanotechnology to build new tools that will eventually lead to advances not only in basic science, but also in areas like manufacturing and electronics and medicine. So if that's the long-term vision, how do we actually tackle this challenge in the lab? What we do is we take those exact same components that we find in nature and we reprogram them in different ways. And for many researchers, myself included, our molecule of choice is DNA. The reason for using DNA is that many properties that make it useful as an information storage molecule in nature also make it attractive as a nanoscale building material. And of course, everyone in our field owes a great debt to Ned Seaman, who pioneered this area of research, starting with a seminal paper that he published back in 1982. The nice thing about DNA is that it's simple and relatively easy to work with. There are only two standard base pairs. DNA has roughly a two nanometer diameter and each base is about a third of a nanometer wide. And the double helix has a pretty simple and regular helical geometry. Furthermore, nature has evolved an entire enzymatic toolkit for making modifications to DNA, such as splicing it together with enzymes called ligases, 
or cutting it apart with restriction enzymes, or making copies of it with polymerases. It's also really easy to synthesize DNA from scratch. You simply input the sequences into a computer that controls a DNA synthesizer, and in a matter of hours you can have pretty much any sequence you want. And there are companies all over the world that will sell you this synthesized DNA for pennies per base. For the last couple decades, researchers have been using short pieces of DNA to build various shapes. In 2006, Paul Rodeman at Caltech invented a really powerful method to build larger and more complicated shapes using hundreds of short strands that bind to a long template strand. This method is called DNA origami, and it's been the foundation of my own research for the last several years. So what we do is write computer programs to design sequences of DNA such that when we mix them together, they self-assemble into desired shapes with dimensions of 10 to 100 nanometers. Recently, we worked in William Shee's lab to extend the DNA origami method to create three-dimensional shapes. Looking forward, we're currently using DNA origami along with functional modifications such as protein or nanoparticle attachments in order to start building tools that are precisely the right size and shape for carrying out experiments on the nanoscale. Okay, so that's about it for this basic introduction to bio-nanotechnology, at least as it relates to my own research. Hopefully you guys found this interesting, and if you found it so interesting that you want to know more or contact us, please check out our links, and thanks for watching. therapeutics directly to the cancer tissues while minimizing undesirable toxicity to the rest of the body. Nanoparticle formulation begins with the solution of drug and polymer molecules in an organic solvent. The blue spheres represent an anti-cancer chemotherapeutic agent, while the white strands represent dye-block copolymers, which are realistically more flexible than shown here. A dye-block copolymer is composed of two joined polymer chains, a hydrophilic or water-loving block, shown in blue, and a hydrophobic or water-fearing block, shown in orange. Nanoparticle formation is accomplished via the dropwise addition of the organic solution to rapidly stirred water. The initially disordered copolymers rapidly self-assemble at the organic water interface of the nanodroplets reorienting themselves so that the hydrophobic blocks are surrounded and stabilized by the hydrophilic blocks. This polymeric coating can be subsequently surface modified with various cancer targeting ligands such as antibodies or small molecules. The nanoparticle solution can then be modified into a form to allow for intravenous administration. The nanoparticles are quickly distributed throughout the body by the circulatory system, with which they are also delivered to the site of the tumor.
100 times smaller than red blood cells, nanoparticles possess the unique ability to permeate through the leaky walls of tumor vasculature, which are formed during the process of tumor growth. Through this passive targeting technique, the nanoparticles can be concentrated within the tumor tissue. On the cancer cell surface membrane, the nanoparticles encounter surface receptor molecules, microscopic markers expressed on cancer cells but not expressed by normal tissue. The nanoparticles targeting ligands bind specifically to these receptors, triggering a response also known as receptor-mediated endocytosis, which draws the nanoparticles into the cancer cell. This process enables thousands of nanoparticles to enter into each of the targeted cancer cells. Inside the cell, the nanoparticles are enveloped in endosomes. These endosomes merge to form larger endosomes, or eventually lysosomes, the digestive stomachs of cells. The anti-cancer drugs can be released in a controlled manner by the degradation of the polymer nanoparticle shell. The highly toxic chemotherapy can thus be delivered directly at the site of intended action without affecting other body systems. Typically, the drugs will cause the cancer cells to undergo apoptosis, or programmed cell death. This nanoparticle therapy can eventually lead to the eradication of the tumor mass.